so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Janet Troutwine. Uh, she's the Chief Executive Officer of the National Association of Health Underwriters in Washington, D.C. NAHU represents more than 100,000 employee benefits professionals involved in the design, sale, implementation, and management of health plans all over the United States. Her responsibilities include oversight of all NAHU activities and primary representation of the association to the media, government agencies, and elected officials at all levels. Prior to becoming the CEO of NAHU in 2005, Janet served for many years as the head of NAHU's Government Affairs Department, working with members of Congress, senior government officials, governors, and state legislators, and directing the government and political affairs of the organization. A frequent speaker on health policy issues, Janet's expertise in issues related to the uninsured, health insurance pools, risk, and reinsurance pooling, health-related tax issues, and both national and global health reform has been recognized throughout the industry. Janet has been asked to testify before Congress numerous times. Did it all go well? And has been published in major newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. She's appeared on hundreds of radio and television programs around the world, and she's here with us today. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. I have so much to talk to you about, and um, I'm going to try to get through it as so I can see what I'm doing. I'm using a Prezi here for those of you that are not familiar with it. So I'm kind of going uh, to the middle of my presentation because I want to just really talk to you about the most important things that are going on. Because this, you hear all kinds of things on um, of the, of the media. Sometimes you don't know what to believe. So I, for those of you that know me at all or have watched me over the years, I'm going to always shoot straight with you and tell you exactly the way it is and uh, what's important and what's not important. Not that everything isn't important, it is, but some things are more important than others and what to watch for, which may not be the, what you think you should be watching for. So some of the little nuances are the things that actually make a difference in what happens with, with the things that relate to you. So the most important thing to understand right now is something that you've probably heard me say before, and that is is that uh, Washington, D.C. is a very hostile place. It's, um, it's fractured. It's, it's a, the ability to get things done is extremely limited. So we have a lot of hostility in Congress. The Republicans and Democrats definitely don't want to work together, but we often have problems with Republicans and Republicans working together. Um, Le it's less of an issue on, uh, among Democrats, but Republicans are definitely a lot of um, infighting in the party. And it was particularly so before uh, Paul Ryan took over when John Boehner was the speaker. He had a lot of trouble controlling his caucus because the diversity inside there and the, uh, and it's not that we have liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans. We have we're conservative very conservative, very, very, very conservative, right of a tell of the Hun, you know, it's just, it's, it's very, it's, it's extremely, it's kind of an extreme situation. And then when you look at Democrats, a lot of the middle of the road Democrats that we had before are no longer in office. And so we, if, there's no wonder that they have trouble working on a bipartisan basis because each party kind of represents the extremes of their ideology. And so it's really hard for them to work together. We don't have anybody in the middle to bring people together. Often NAHU actually serves that function. They do not, when they are, when they do need to work on something on a bipartisan basis, they don't find their own co-sponsors anymore. We do that uh, when we want, when it's something we want them to do. If we don't want them to do it, we don't help. Uh, you know, that's so, it, that's just the way it is. But it's very fractured and that's just important to remember. And anything that you see, no matter what someone says that they're going to do or promises that they're going to do on the campaign trail. Anyone's ability to fulfill one single campaign promise is pretty limited because um, no, no member of Congress is a ruler unto themselves um, and you know, the people in the House have to deal with the Senate, they have to deal with the White House and so forth. So the ability to get things done is really, really tough right now and it's we um, have been able to get 
way more things done than we should have been able to, given the environment that we're dealing with. There have been a few small signs of bipartisan cooperation, uh, but not too many. You can see uh, that there, are, in terms of health reform strategies that uh, anyone agrees on, there are very few. I'm going to talk to you kind of about a couple of what I would call the prevailing ideas and why they're prevailing and what parts of those you might want to look at more carefully because, as you know, um, next week we have the first presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And so some of these health issues are probably going to come up and maybe not that one, but one of the one or more of the debates. And it'll be interesting to see how they characterize it. So I'm glad I could be here before that one so that you might kind of listen for some things that you might not otherwise have thought meant anything when they said or didn't say them. Um, okay, let me keep going here. I want to talk before we get into uh, the presidential candidates a little bit about the House. I mentioned Paul Ryan. So Paul Ryan is a person to watch over the next 10 years. Person to watch. I, I would, he definitely will be a presidential candidate. Um, he, good chance he could win. Depend, maybe, he probably won't run next time, but maybe the time after you know the next presidential season after that. And the reason why he might win is because he's one of the most intelligent people um, that, there, that are in Washington, D.C. He is very, very well respected. He has a lot of charm and charisma, but not charm like empty charm. People actually like him. All the, the Democrats like him even when they don't agree with him. And so he's able to persuade people of his ideas. And this is a really important thing to remember because not all of Paul Ryan's ideas are things that you would like with your clients. He is really, really conservative. So in his perfect ideal world, um, everyone would own their own health insurance independently. There, there wouldn't be any employer-sponsored health insurance. How would you like that? Uh, right? Well, first of all, it wouldn't be very efficient. And we could go into all the reasons why it's just really not a great idea. But probably from a business perspective, that's probably not a great idea for you either, I would guess, for many of you. So um, he, I'm going to talk a little bit more about his big plan that he's proposed. But he's, um, he does have a, you've got to remember that he's very conservative. And so no matter what he's looking at, he's going to look at it through that lens. And, it's, and so watch. And it's, you'll, when you hear him speak, um, you would, if you haven't heard him talk before, you will like him too. No matter what party you are in here, he's just... He's, he's just like that, sort of like Bill Clinton, who can charm anyone. Um, if you've ever heard Bill Clinton speak, he does the same thing. Whether you like him or not, or no matter what you think about him, he's a really good speaker. And so is Paul Ryan, but in a kind of different, more um, intellectual kind of way. Uh, well, uh, one of the things, before I talk about his paper, let me talk about what's going to happen in the election. So it's really important, again, all the different parts of, of what happens in the election, not just which presidential candidate wins. So in the House, the Republicans have the majority right now. They will most certainly retain the majority in the House. They are probably going to lose about eight to 12 seats, but they will still have the majority, just not as uh, big of a majority, so, which means that uh, they can push through almost anything they want. In the House, members of Congress are reelected every two years. And so they're constantly running for office. So when you, when you hear um, your member of Congress in the House talking, you might notice, and just listen for this when you're listening to them, any member that's in the House, not the Senate, their remarks sound much more political and more pointed. Now just watch for this the next time you hear them talk. And in the Senate, they sound a little bit more reserved and calm. And the reason for that is, is that people in the House are always running for office. So it is every two years, but given our high-tech age, there's nothing that they can ever say or do that's not on the record. So it's, they're just constantly, constantly, constantly campaigning, raising money to campaign for the next thing. Because even the, the ones with the most purest, uh, the pure ideals, they still have to get elected to office in order to fulfill those things. So they're all, their number one goal is always to be reelected, always. Uh, so they will still retain the majority, um, in, the Republicans will, in the House. And one other thing to remember about the House 
is the reason why we see so many things pass through the House is because things can pass there with a 51% majority. They don't, there's no, all of the special procedures that exist in the Senate don't exist in the House. Really important to remember. So I want to talk about um, Paul Ryan's white paper because a lot of it has uh, trickled through to the Republican platform. And in fact, some of these ideas have been in Republican uh, notions for health reform for years. But the one that I want to focus on the most, that if you don't remember a single other thing I said today, I hope you will remember this one thing, is there is a huge movement, particularly among Republicans, to do something different with the employer tax exclusion. So this is not an employer's deduction for, for providing coverage, but it's the exclusion that means that anything that the employer pays for is not taxable to the employee. And if you think about how much health insurance costs these days, you can see that um, if it were taxable, that would be a pretty big tax hit for a lot of people. I certainly don't want it. Uh, it, it would be very, um, a very significant amount of tax. Tax is regular income. So uh, Paul Ryan's real idea is that the exclusion would go away. But he's gotten so much pushback uh, from us and others on that particular issue that now he put forth in his paper a cap on the exclusion. Now, it's hard to, to see where a cap would, how they could pick an arbitrary number that would be right. You know, how do you decide what is an excessive employer payment? Because it really depends, you can't say, well, if premiums are over a certain dollar amount, we all know that premiums are what they are for different reasons. Geography, age, on your larger groups, overall claims experience on the group, right? So um, we think this is a really bad idea, and we've been pushing back on it with some success, and we're going to continue to. But this is likely to be one where we ask you to respond via Operation Shout and that sort of thing. We also work it via the media and op-eds and so forth. But this is a really, this whole concept of capping the exclusion, it's a lot of money. This is why they want to do it. It's, it's billions of dollars a year in tax preference. So it's a nice pot of money. Everyone has their eye on it to, for whatever their pet project is to see if they could perhaps use that money differently. So that's one of the big ideas. They want to uh, take a look at guaranteed issue and go back to the high risk pool method instead. I'll keep going, but it's, you know, for that. Uh, they um, remember association health plans. I'm not talking about the legitimate ones that we have out today. I mean, the old concept that they would be extremely prevalent and that that would be the primary way um, to purchase for small businesses to purchase coverage. That's a, a huge deal that's still very, very prevalent among Republicans, and it did make it on, into Paul Ryan's overall plan. They wanted to expand tax incentives for buying coverage, but again, which is fine. Some people do need to buy in the individual market. Probably we should increase deductibility for people that buy in that market, but they want to pay for it by taking away the benefits from other people. Uh, help promoting health savings accounts, nothing wrong with that. I, so this is uh, this, this word, um, implement Medicare premium support. So what does that mean? This is code for privatized Medicare. So, so that everything would be um, Medicare Advantage, but there would also be uh, different ways of, it would almost be like everyone would be into the individual market that's in the Medicare program, which there's, a, there's actually a reason, which I don't have time to go into, but historically, if you look back at why we ever got Medicare, it's because of it's a very difficult to support a market where you've got a, such high cost medical expenses. There's a reason why we have Medicare today, in other words. So this is, um, some of you might like the idea or not. <laughs> it's, you, know, you have to be careful with it. And then a really huge idea among Republicans, all different versions of this concept, but is an idea of per capita Medicaid disbursements. And so instead of um, having Medicaid programs that are run like they are today, they would each state would receive an allotment based on their population from the fed, federal government, and then of course they would continue to fund state portions on their own. And in some cases this would work, and in other cases it would be really devastating for some areas, particularly those with smaller populations, but, but which might have higher medical costs because of the rural nature of their areas and 
uh, the limita limited number of medical providers and so forth. So there are definitely winners and losers with this kind of a proposal. So that's the Republican idea in primarily. Uh, let me back up. So I want to talk a little bit about the Senate. And with the Senate, uh, senators are reelected every six years, so only one third of them are up in any given election. So we only have a third of the Senate up right now, which means we can look very closely at the races that there are and pretty much figure out which ones are likely to flip either Republican to Democrat or Democrat to Republican. So we've looked really closely at this. Most of the seats that are in jeopardy are actually Republican seats. So there's a high likelihood that uh, the Senate will flip to uh, being controlled by Democrats. But it would be, it'll be a very narrow majority, which isn't very helpful to wh whoever the winning majority is because of parliamentary procedures in the Senate. In the Senate, in order for something to pass, it could pass by a simple majority, but it never happens. And the reason for that is the availability of things like holds and filibusters and other parliamentary procedures that can slow things down. And they're used virtually every time anything comes up for a vote. And it's that the idea is to slow it down, to either stop something in its tracks, and, uh, and it's usually to stop something. The only way to stop a filibuster or and you don't always hear about every filibuster that occurs, by the way. They, they happen all of the time, and holds are even more common. A hold is where any senator can anonymously say, I don't want this to go anywhere, and it doesn't go anywhere. It just sits there. And the only way to break that hold or the filibuster is with um, a vote of cl what's called cloture, which means that 60 people have to say, Stop the nonsense, let's move forward with this item that we were considering. Now, there are 100 members of the Senate, and when you have a narrow majority, so let's, let's pretend for a moment that the Democrats hold it with 51 members and the Republicans have 49. So we have to get 60 people to vote the same way. So can you see how hard it is to get anything done in the Senate? So the Senate is a, slows things down, and sometimes the House slows things down for, for different reasons, usually for completely partisan reasons for the most part. But there, this fact that we have this diversity in the Congress is really important to you to know that no matter what kind of proposal you hear being pushed forward, there are automatic stop signs there and things that will slow it down to allow a more appropriate level of deliberation. So, for example, even when... Um, in the days when Bush was in office and we had um, a control, a Republican-controlled House and Senate and White House, we did not get any health reform measures of substance other than HSAs while they were in. And the, we, I take it back, we did get the Medicare Modernization Act, but I'm talking about under 65 health reform because these proposals have been out here for years. It, when nothing happened until the ACA. Even when the Republicans controlled all of these branches, they didn't get their association health plans through and various other things. It's really hard to do. It's hard to get momentum for all of this stuff to go through. So that's the point I wanted to make, is when you hear about these switches over in the Senate, unless you heard that either party had 60 um, members, then nothing goes is going to move very fast. So the Senate um, also has um, a less, uh, I would say, a less prevalent a position because it's definitely not the slightest bit bipartisan, but these are, this is kind of the Republican idea of what a repeal and replace would look like. So they also talk about the capping the exclusion. They talk about the high risk pools again. Uh, they have something in there that we like, which is making the uh, age rating more flexible. We like that a lot. Um, they would change the way tax credits are structured and they would they would expand their availability, but reduce it at the same time by reducing the poverty level that they were available for. You see how the prominent health savings account, they have malpractice tort reform, which is good, except that for the most part, this is much easier done at the state level. But they would like to have it done at the federal level. And then again, you see this concept of per capita Medicaid spending. I'm sorry I'm going so fast, but I want to make sure I cover the main points here that, for you all and give you time for questions. Um, this illustration here is actually pretty important. So look at the green, number of green checks you see and the dates. That's how many days they're actually going to be in D.C. 
The rest of the time they're out campaigning. So you can see they're gone all of October. I don't even think they're going to really be here next week. I think they'll probably leave Friday and, and not. I don't think they'll be here next week. Maybe one, either the House or the Senate might be for a couple days. And then you can see they're not in very long in November. They had this lame duck session in December. So any, any of the time that they're in, they're going to be looking at what do we have to do to keep the wheels turning on the bus. So it won't be anything um, significant that they're able to get done. But you have to be really careful during times like that because people make assumptions that they're not going to get anything done, and that's when they can attach something to something else that's moving. So we're watching that really closely because at the moment, there's nothing that we want them to attach that they would. In other words, they're not going to repeal the Cadillac tax on an attachment, but they could do something uh, like another piece of legislation that I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on, but it expands the availability of health reimbursement arrangements in a way that's not good and would be detrimental to the group market. So it would allow employers to just deposit money into an HRA and let people purchase health insurance in the individual market with it but it does it in such a way that it would pull the best risks out of the small employer market, making coverage there more expensive, which I assume we don't want, right? Uh, so anyway, it's, not, it's poorly structured. We think not ready for prime time at all, and we've been in encouraging them not to pass that. But they could try to, Republicans could try to um, attach that to something that's moving. Uh, I think that Democrats would stop it, but those, that's just an example. So what are we working on? I'm gonna flip through these real quickly. We are definitely opposing any measures to take away the exclusion on employer paid benefits. Obviously, we always work on role of the agent issues. So anything that has to do with broker issues, including the medical loss ratio, we're still on it. Uh, the Cadillac tax repeal. Employer reporting, to make it easier for your clients on employer reporting, that's actually moving. That, might, that actually could happen in the lame duck session because we've got a lot, we actually have bipartisan support from it. A lot of Democrats and Republicans are getting complaints from people in their districts that this is just too cumbersome a process. And we've been working with uh, p legislation and the bill sponsors of the legislation and having them talk with the Treasury Department to try to come to some meeting of the minds on what would be acceptable all, the, all across the board. So this is, it could happen. I feel kind of encouraged about that. We also work on issues related to what is a full-time employee. So we, 30 hours we think is too low, and a lot of uh, Democrats and Republicans agree with that. Uh, if there's a health insurance tax that increases the cost of coverage, we did get a one-year delay on that, which is gonna be going away soon. Um, I don't feel too encouraged about that being extended, to be honest with you. Remember, I'm always the one that tells you the way it actually is, right? So um, we have changes potentially to the small business tax credit to make it uh, more useful to people. And then for those of you um, in the Medicare space, we, we actually constantly work with CMS on regulatory issues. So we meet with them frequently all the time. But there are two legislative issues that, are, uh, that we're working on that we are fairly encouraged about. One is... You may recall that before the ACA, there was a second open enrollment period for Medicare Advantage that occurred in January, and we're trying to get that restored. And then the, um, the second one I feel really good about, and this is again one that could happen this year, is changing the way COBRA is considered. When someone goes out on COBRA, some, often they don't realize that that's no longer considered active employer coverage, and often they don't elect Part B on time. And so this would um, take, take away that penalty for not enrolling in, in Part B on time for people that are in this category. That's actually moving and, and could get attached on something moving even this month, but more likely in the lame duck. Uh, this, uh, just to let you, that if you're interested, I don't have time to go through this, but if you're interested in that legislation I referred to on HRAs, the one that would allow employers to put it into the individual market. This is a really big idea among Republicans that to offer choice. It's just not very actuarially sound. It's, it's poorly structured and it would probably do, we think, more harm than good. Um, NEHU's position on this is actually neutral, but not really because we're concerned about its structure. So we haven't given anyone any letters of support or anything of the normal things that we normally might do for something that would offer choice. 
because of the way it's structured and the fact that it could have unintended consequences. So it's HR 5447 if you want to look more. And just quickly, some of the other things that we do, I, I mentioned this but probably didn't go into enough detail. We comment on every single thing that has anything to do with anything you do. And when I say that we comment on regulatory advice, we provide detailed comments. So our average comment letter is about 15 pages long. And we go into every little nitty gritty detail and that the regulators really like us because of this, because we're not a bunch of fluff. We're able to get down in the weeds and provide substantive comments. So they frequently call us when they get our comments and ask, well, did you mean that we should do it like this? And uh, we actually looked recently to see how many of our comments they actually do. And it's about 50%. It's unheard of. Unheard of. We, there's no one that has a better track record with uh, getting things that we request in comments than NEHU does. We're really good at it. So we, uh, we had all kinds of things that we're commenting on. We commented on special enrollment periods. We commented on the fiduciary rule. We're actually working with the Department of Labor. This was the one that had to do with if you're involved in HSAs and providing investment advice, et cetera, et cetera. Remember that one? Well, we're actually working with the Department of Labor on FAQs so that you don't get hung up in any snags so that the information that most of you are providing your clients is actually falls into the education category, but we want to really clearly define that so that people aren't worried that they can't help their clients with HSAs anymore. The only time where you fall into, under this fiduciary rule, actually, is if you're actually providing direct investment advice, you know, invest it here, you know, we think you should, um, you know, not spend it, invest it instead, put it in this vehicle, and so forth. That's investment advice, not the stuff that you all normally do where you're saying, you know, an HSA does have the ability to have invest. That's a different statement, right? So we're working, just to give you an example, that's the kinds of things we work on with agencies are things to make it easier for you to operate and easier for your clients to have the kinds of choices that make, that are real um, uh, valuable choices. So we have, um, we've had strong relationships with every administration. I've been in um, DC since 1997. We always make a point to find whatever common spot we have with any administration early on, uh, even if it um, feels like it's a little bit of a combative relationship, we uh, find something that we have in common early on. With the Obama administration, it was support for employer-sponsored coverage, and that has been a really strong um, bonding thing. Bonding is probably not the right word, but it's allowed us to work very closely with the administration because it's a very common and strong goal that both of uh, that we shared with this administration, and then others we uh, bond on different things. So we, you find what your main thing is, and that's how you make solidify your relationship, and it allows you to work on pretty much everything that you want. We also work with uh, the. Um, all of the other agencies, but also with the NAIC at the state level. So our um, staff does work with uh, your commissioner and their staff. Do we have anyone from the commissioner's office in here? No? Okay. Um, well, sometimes it's a little challenging with your, with your commissioner. He um, can get be a little bit more difficult to work with, and then other times not. It just depends on what the issue is. Um, so we, we actually work on a lot of statutory working groups that are congressionally created. So for example, um, if, a, if a law, like the ACA had several statutory working groups that it created that said that uh, the NEIC was to have this working group on such and such and to appoint people. And we always get appointed to those. The NEIC always appoints us to those. So we, we're on a lot of these congressionally created working groups. Um, okay, I'm going to keep going because I want to take your questions in just a second. I just want to point out um, one other thing that I think is pretty important. There are a lot of different ways to get things done. So you, if you hear from us on Operation Shout and we ask you to respond, that's one way of getting things done, and it's a really important way. Our, it shows our grassroots strength. Um, sometimes we don't do it in a loud way. So if just the fact that you don't see us on something does not mean we're not working on it. Sometimes the best thing to do is to do it quietly. We've, got, we've gotten a lot of things attached to moving legislation, 
And in that case, what we do is we just kind of arrange for people that might otherwise oppose what we're trying to do to be quiet. And these relationships that we have over the years, we don't need them to be on board with it. We just need them to be quiet sometimes. So for example, um, one office that you're going to be really surprised at that's been very cooperative with being quiet on occasion has been Harry Reid's office. Are you surprised? Yeah, you are, aren't you? Uh, they, they, if we, they have a really good health policy person in there that we work with, and if we, and, and they, and they have a really good relationship, by the way, with the NAHU members in his district. So. When we say, look, this is going to be bad and here is why, you know, she's a smart person and we, if we explain it correctly, we just need to, to get this part out. Um, would, you, would you mind cooperating with us on that? She says, sure, we'll be quiet or we'll keep something else. If, they, if we want it to not go through, we can say, you know, can you just put the brakes up on this one here? We, we, that's moving too quickly. And they cooperate there too. So. I'm only using that as an example. They're only one place. We, sometimes it's a Republican that we need to cooperate to be quiet. So quiet is an okay way to get things done. So make no assumptions that we're not working on something. And then the other loud way we do it is through the media. So we can put pressure on members of Congress through op-eds that appear in their district or that appear inside the Beltway. Depending on what we're trying to do, sometimes one way is better than another way. So we do that a lot. And then the other thing that we do is obviously through HUPAC, through our PAC, very, very important way to do it. The larger your PAC is, the more influential you are seen as being. You're seeing, seen as being able to influence elections. And that's important because remember, they all always want, are campaigning all the time. So our, the size of our PAC has grown and grown over the years. And it's helped our overall level of influence. So we are considered a must consult organization for all of these reasons, that we're, uh, we're considered to be politically sophisticated and smart, but we also have a good reputation as being in the middle and for doing the right thing and for having policy depth, which they really like, and not every organization has that. So we've, uh, I'm, I think that as NEHU members, I, just, I guess what I'm trying to stress to you is that we um, represent you really well in cooperation with the things that you help us with and uh, I think that we've got um, the team with us and all of you is works uh, pretty well most of the time. Okay, um, just really quickly, and I would say that I would get these slides to you, but it's, these are Prezi and it's a little bit more difficult. I'm happy to send a link to anybody that wants to mess with the Prezi. But the, the, most of the things that are in the Republican and Democrat platforms I've, are things that I've mentioned already. A couple of other things I would throw out. Hillary Clinton is likely to uh, favor, if, the, if we continue to see exodus from the exchanges by carriers across the country, we are likely to see some efforts towards a public option to, uh, to make sure that there is at least something available in each state. We're going to push back really hard against any sort of public option efforts. But that's something you might see. You also might see an effort to expand Medicare to people 55 and older. Um, and that, again, that depends on what the individual market is doing and how much availability there is there. They would buy into it. It wouldn't just be like Medicare is for people at 65. But, um, and, and um, those are the, the main things. Everything else I've mentioned to you already. Um, I'm going to skip this part. These are the, the dates of the debates coming up. Uh, and one of the th and then we have election day and someone's going to win and then someone will be inaugurated. So um, <laughs> so the most, uh, so you think, well, yeah, either one, one or the other, it'll be one of them. Well, the most important thing for us is who the political appointees are, by far, because that's who we work with. We don't work with whoever the president is because they're, the, uh, frankly, the president is a generalist. We're specialists. So we work with whoever their health people are in the Department of Labor and the HHS and, and SOSIO and the Treasury Department and all the people that work with employer-sponsored plans. So we care a lot about who they appoint. We live or die by the political appointees and we go through a lot of them in every administration. And those relationships that we build early on with the political appointees are critical for you. So that we go to a lot of trouble. Right now we're in the 
uh, in our office, we're anticipating who political appointees would be, solidifying relationships where we think any, where we just don't know them well enough. Because we can pretty much count on, no, we know who most of them will be, just because there's kind of a, a suspect pool about who would normally would be asked. We're less uh, knowing of who it would be under a Trump administration, because some of the likely suspects have said they won't work for Trump. But, but you know, if they were actually asked, they might change their minds, so you don't really know that for sure. That might just be uh, a little bit of political blustering there. But the, I, I can't tell you how important the political appointees are. So that's something that we work on a lot. We don't talk about a lot in Washington Update, but we work real closely with them because that's what helps us get that regulatory success that I talked about, is making sure that they trust us and know that, we are, uh, that we're good at what we do and, and reasonable people. So um, what would happen in the first 100 days? Obviously, um, Hillary Clinton is not likely to repeal Obama's executive orders, but Trump would. So all executive orders, not regulations, but things that come under the category of executive orders would be repealed. Uh, if Trump wins, there would be another more efforts to repeal and replace, but I already told you about where all the stop signs are. So there it's, it's, you know, it's unlikely to happen. So we're not going to have, there, there will be no repeal and replace. It is not possible that it will happen. It, I guess it could happen you know, 10 years from now. I don't know how, then it would be, what are you even looking at? But we will have effort, some significant changes. We could have certain provisions that are repealed. And um, I've already told you about what the candidates want, and you hear about all this, the um, stuff, so I'm not going to keep going there. So what I want to do now is, do I have time for questions still? OK. So I, I really want to make sure that I don't get out of here without you asking your questions about anything I've just said or anything else you want to ask me. So I would like to open it up. What, uh, and I don't mean to make you an odds maker, but what likelihood would you give that to passing? Um, it actually, I'm worried about it. I don't, I don't, I think that we've kind of arranged for it not to go anywhere this year. Although if we had a couple of uh, Democrat senators who said, this is really important for my district, I'm in a swing district, I need to be able to support this because a lot, there are a lot of Republicans in my district. Uh, then the arrangement to put the brakes on might go away. But I've had kind of a commitment from our, our contacts that they'll sort of keep it from happening before the end of this year. Um, after uh, Harry, then Harry Reid will be gone. So obviously we're gonna keep, continue to work on it, but I think it's likely to happen. We have some Democrats who think it's a good idea. They, what we're gonna try to do, we are, it's not going to happen in its current form. So what we have to go out and we have to just say, we just don't think this is a good idea, period. What we're likely to end up with is that it'll pass, but it'll only be for microgroups. And micro, the definition of whether they'll make that five or 10, I don't know. But I think it probably might happen. Um, we're going to try to modify the language and make it much less uh, harmful. The way it's written right now is just not written well. It would be bad the way it is. So we're going to try to have it where it at least affects as little as possible of the market. Does that answer your question? And the is Yeah, the, the issue is an, an employer who wants to do this kind of thing is not going to put much into the HRA, right? So they'll put in 500 or $1,000, nothing of what it actually takes to purchase coverage. So the employees who will take that up will be those that are sick. So number one, it exacerbates the adverse selection we are already seeing in the individual market. The ones that will do it, that will be interested in this, will um, be the healthiest risks that will be pulled out of the small employer market, right? So we don't want any healthy risks coming. The small employer market's doing a lot better than the individual market is in most places in the country. So we don't want to have that dynamic um, going on. And then what we're also seeing is a number of small groups that had already decided, absent this legislation, to stop offering group coverage and they went into the individual market. Many of those have boomeranged back into the small employer market because of the 
much more limited availability in most of the country in the individual market than very narrow networks, much higher cost sharing and so forth. I don't know, it's not quite as bad here as it is in most parts of the country. It's pretty significant elsewhere. So the issue um, there is, is when they boomerang back in, which of the groups will boomerang back in? The sick ones, because guess what? The coverage that they could get over here wasn't good enough, which means that they're using it more, right? So do you see how the, adver what we have, the, the way they've created it right now, we have adverse selection on both sides. We've in we're encouraging the sicker ones to go into the individual market and, the sicker, and then the sicker on this side to go back over here, so we've kind of hurt both markets. Is that? So it just needs, it needs uh, it's not ready for prime time at all. <laughs> it needs some work, and we'd rather it just didn't happen at all, but we're going to provide them some substitute language that we talked to them about last week uh, if they feel so compelled to do it that at least they have some reasonable way of doing it. But we don't want to, didn't want to lead with that. We just really would prefer they didn't do it at all. Anybody else? Yes? Hi. The procedure in the Senate, the hold, that's the first time I've been familiar with that. That seems to be quite a tactic. Does there, are there any limitations? Uh, can anybody put anything on a hold? Yes. Whether they're involved with a uh, law uh, being presented or not? Yes, they can. Any senator can do it. All they have to do is they have to go to their uh, leader, their leader. So if they're in the minority, they go to the minority leader. And if they're in the majority, they go to the majority leader. They privately um, tell their leader that they're putting a hold on it. The leader cannot, theoretically can't stop them from doing that. I guess they could talk them out of it by, you know, threatening to not support them on fundraising. That's happened before, by the way. <laughs> you know, but, but yeah, anybody can do it. It's, they do it all the time. Are there limitations on the number of holds they can put on? Or? Nope. No. Oh. This is why things get held up in the Senate. We don't hear about this. We always, you know, the filibuster is much more exciting. You know, somebody's reading from the phone book. And, but these holds are much more common. They happen all the time. That's insane. Yeah. And, it's, so it's, it's, and it can only be broken by a vote of cloture, 60 votes. So 60 in the Senate is the magic number. Just a question like a consumer rights point of view. I see so many groups with 12 one effective dates and it's the sickest employees that are moving potentially at the employer's decision that have already hit their out-of-pocket max and if they have another surgery in December, they had another out-of-pocket max. Is there ever discussion, I know it's the insurance companies wouldn't like it, but from the employee perspective to have a mandate that a company, if you're changing within the calendar year, that the new carrier gives out-of-pocket max credit because I've seen employees that have thousands and thousands of dollars of extra bills in December. It's pretty rare, but it, it's the sickest people who get hit with that. Uh, I wouldn't, we don't have anyone currently working on that. We do hear discussions about it from time to time in some of the, some of the think tanks and some of the organizations that are, uh, there's, there are several of them. So we hear it discussed, like the Georgetown Health Policy Institute has talked about it a little bit. So it could definitely happen under a Clinton administration because she's really concerned with out-of-pocket. That's a big deal for her is out-of-pocket amounts that people have. So that would likely be something that could come forward and it could even be done on a regulatory basis as opposed to legislative. Thank you. Anybody else? I hope you're all using our compliance corner uh, is everyone using the compliance corner? Hopefully. Do you know what it is? <laughs> so if you're a member of NEHU, you have the right to use our compliance corner. It's on our website. It's very comprehensive. And every month we have free compliance corner webinars that are very up to the date. If you haven't been paying attention, they're all recorded and they're housed there. and You can go back and look at them. And I would encourage you to do that because I'll tell you, if you... Um, if you all actually watched all those compliance corners, you would be light years ahead of your competitors. You would have a, a huge competitive advantage that, that others in your community that do not have. So I would encourage you to, to look at, at those. 
Also, there's a place on there where if you have an issue where you're not quite sure, you know, legislatively or regula re from a regulatory perspective, what the rule is on something, you can just type in anonymously your question, and we have an employee whose whole job is to answer those for you free. So make sure you take advantage of that. And there's also a frequently asked questions blog that will be really helpful to you for people, even things that you might think to ask, but that you might not have even thought to ask, that other people have, you can learn from, what, from that as well. So I would just encourage you to make sure you're using those um, to the largest extent. I see you. Either talk loud or she's bringing the microphone. talking about and thinking about for a long time, and that is uh, the idea to move Medicare age down to 55. My logic is that the people who are 55 to 64 are arguably the least healthy of those people between the ages of zero and 64. And the people 55 to 64 are arguably the most healthy of those 55 and over, and certainly more healthy than those who are 65 and over. So allowing people to buy into Medicare starting at age 55 would produce a lot of uh, income to the system and would also then provide the opportuni uh, opportunity for those t people to buy Medicare supplement plans and Medicare Advantage plans. Um, is, there, uh, is there a part of my logic that I'm not uh, considering? And I'd just like your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, there's a lot of, um, there, there's some level of support from some people over what you just the, proposed. So expanding, I mentioned that before, that it was a, a Clinton idea. It's actually been around for a long time. The, uh, whether or not it would be better for any particular consumer is, depends on how they structure it. Because they would have it as, it would be really different from the Medicare program that's for everybody else. It would be a buy-in. So if you look at how much Medicare actually costs, whether it would be less expensive for an individual, maybe or maybe not. I, you know, I think it just depends on a lot of different things. But we, we have continued to hear that, and I, I know that it's difficult for people to afford coverage, and I think we just would have to look at how a proposal like that would be structured and whether or not um, Medicare Advantage would be expanded to, to pull and be available for people in that category, for example. And so would the supplement companies do it? And how fast would it be implemented? So would all of that happen at the same time? See where I'm going here? So I, I think that the, we do have to look at a specific proposal. But there, there, it's been discussed for a long time because it's always, it is expensive for people in that age group to buy private coverage today, even with the rating changes with the Affordable Care Act. So I hear what you're saying. We, we would have to look at a current proposal because we don't, there's no active real proposal out there right now. And it would have to combine all of those things, otherwise it would be harmful. So it, ha it would have to have all of those private components to back it up and that it have to be structured right and financially sound. So it couldn't be so price preference that people were not paying what they ought to be paying for the coverage they were getting. Tell me when I need to stop. I'm I have one quick question for you. Sure. Um, so we've seen, um, being from a nationwide broker, I've seen a lot of our regional competitors, as far as carriers are concerned, going out of business over the past 24 months. We had Health Pass in New York, Medical Mutual in Ohio. We see more and more of the monopolized states by one or two carriers like Minnesota right now. With a pending merger of two of our most nationwide carriers, our largest nationwide carriers in the business, how do you anticipate, or what do you anticipate, will be the result of that as we continue to move forward into this possible conglomeration um, in the short term as well as in the long term? Well, I, I think that some consolidation is kind of inevitable, and we're even seeing that among brokerage agencies, right? Where it's, it's kind of the thing. But um, I'll, I'll just kind of go out on a limb. Um, I don't think the mergers that are pending are going to be approved. Or they, I don't think they'll be approved as they were requested. And, but in any event, when you look at, but let's look at it a little bit more generically than that. When you look at these mergers, are they good or bad? That's the real question. Do they reduce competition? 
or do they enhance affordability? So why would I say that? Well, theoretically, um, if the more market share a particular carrier has, the deeper discounts they're able to negotiate with your medical providers. And when they do that, that reduces the cost of care and therefore the cost of health insurance coverage. I'm, this is all from a theoretical perspective. There's been some pushback that says that they don't always pass those amounts back on to uh, the consumer. However, with, uh, in, when it comes to health insurance and medical loss ratios, there's not a lot of places to hide it. There's mandated percentages. I know we, we don't like the medical loss ratios, but from this perspective, when you look at this particular issue, it actually requires, there's no place for those savings to be hidden because medical costs are what they are and administrative costs are what they are. So if they, the profits, the excess profits, if they didn't pass them back, would go into administrative costs and they'd end up having to rebate it back anyway. Am I making sense to you all the, so the medical loss ratio is actually a little bit of a control on something that might happen if, with a merger like that. Um, but there's, al there's always the chance that competition could be reduced and you would get this monopolistic behavior and less choice of coverage and there would be no competitive pressure to have diver diversity in policy forms and things like that. So it's a kind of a double-edged sword, but it can go either way. We've been kind of uh, neutral on it by just saying, you know, here's what could happen that's good, here's what could happen that's bad. And um, we are often contacted by the agencies that monitor this. They want to look at particular market segments, and they'll say, please uh, connect us with a broker in this area. We want to talk directly with someone that's in this area, and we do that. And that's the extent of our involvement. We give them someone to talk to that has whatever market that they're looking at. If they want, sometimes they'll ask us about Medicare, sometimes they'll ask us about small group and whatever. And they let us know what they want to look at. That's a good question, thank you. Anybody else? I'm done, okay, no, never mind, no one else. Thank you. <laughs>